Frederick Douglass's life is another amazing embodiment of the American dream. Not only did he go from rags to riches, from humble origins to national and international prominence uh, like Benjamin Franklin and Abraham Lincoln, but Douglass actually went from the depths of slavery to ultimately becoming a good friend and official presidential advisor uh, to President Lincoln. Remarkable story. And, you know, how, how did he do it? Um, you get a, a glimpse of that when you read his narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. Uh, and you see that he did it through um, his own just native intelligence, determination, uh, will. Um, he, he taught himself how to read. He was self-educated and didn't just learn how to read, but learned how to write uh, extremely well. I mean, his, his narrative of the life stands on its own as a great work of literature, apart from just the, how important his story is in terms of the you know, historical context and giving us a glimpse into what slavery was like. So the story itself is dramatic and inherently interesting. But in addition to that, just the literary quality of his writing is amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show you a little bit of that here uh, shortly um, as far as his rhetorical skills, how, how his rhetorical skills, his writing style are, are really sophisticated. So Douglas, he says on the, the first page of the narrative, he says, my father was a white man. He was admitted to be such by all I have ever heard speak of my parentage. Uh, a little bit later in the narrative, he says that the rumor was his father was actually his the master, the, his owner. And, and I bring this up mainly because <clears throat> one of the points I want you to see is that um, in, in slavery, a matrilineal system was created. By matrilineal, I mean um, the... Um, the mothers were were really in charge of, of of the children, as opposed to in in many societies which are patrilineal, you know the the way that traditionally in in most cultures, for instance, the um, the last name is, uh, of the father is given to the the children. Uh, the children don't inherit uh, the, their mother's maiden name, for instance. And I bring that up not just because it's interesting, but because what's really interesting about that, what's most interesting about that to me is, is that, um, that that's one of the echoes, if you will, of slavery that remains with us even today. Even today in, in much of the African-American community, um, particularly in inner cities and, and such, um, it, it, there's a a real issue with um, an absence of fathers. Now that's become an issue, not just in the African-American African -American community, but across the board for Caucasians, Hispanics, um, you name it. The, uh, if you look at the data on the dramatic increase in uh, out of wedlock births and in just absent fathers and single mothers raising children, it, it's, it's, it's increased dramatically across the board, but it's even, it's most acute in the African-American community. And there are a number of reasons for that that we don't really have time to go into for the scope of this lecture. Many would argue it's that um, um, for a number of reasons, number of political reasons, the, um, the uh, with the welfare system, it's, it's actually become, there's been an incentive among poor women to not get married uh, because they can get more money from the government uh, remaining single. And that's that's been particularly true, again, in, in inner cities where there are predominantly African-American uh, populations. 
And some would say that the you know, political party that has pushed for that the most, it, it's, it's, you know, it's sold uh, in the guise of concern for the poor, but it's actually the, the real motive, some would say, is, is control. It, it's a new form of not slavery, per se, but a, another way of, of uh, keeping a uh, population of people down by destroying the family structure. Um, and again, that, that's happened uh, with every race, but it's been particularly acute there. So this, you know, the matrilineal system, let me uh, read a couple of quotes that, that point to that. Um, Douglas says, frequently before the child has reached its 12th month, he's talking about in slaves, its mother is taken from it and hired out on some farm a considerable distance off, and the child is placed under the care of an old woman, too old for field labor. For what this separation has done, I do not know, unless it be to hinder the development of the child's affection towards its mother and to blunt and destroy the natural affection of the mother for the child. This is the inevitable result. So you might think, well, how is that matrilineal? Well, you know, this is bad enough, but the, the notice the father's not even in the picture. The, so the father is sold off and, you know, many slaves, most slaves didn't even know who their father was. Again, here, Douglas just has a suspicion. Um, <clears throat> elsewhere, we see um, Douglas says the allowance of the slave children was given to their mothers or the old women having the care of them. So just remember that the, the matrilineal system was put in place during the days of slavery and it persists today in, in different ways. <clears throat> so I mentioned Douglas's rhetorical skill He's an amazing thinker and, and writer. Let me show you an example of that. And this example serves a, a twofold purpose. One, it, it really illustrates the brutality of slavery, but it also highlights Douglas's skills as a writer. So he's, he mentions this Captain Anthony, his, his first master. And he says, he always went around with a cow skin and a heavy cudgel. Uh, cow skin, he's using a, a literary device called synecdoche, where you, instead of naming the thing itself, you, you, to be more poetic, and in this case, I think more vivid, instead of saying he carried a whip, that's what he's talking about, a whip, like a bull whip. But instead, he says a cow skin, and that just makes it even more immediate. It's kind of like when we say, I'm going to throw the pigskin around. We're talking about, you know, football, but calling it, reducing it to literally the, the stuff of which it's made um, makes it even more vivid. So that's the first thing. And now he's going to describe how this, this uh, Captain Anthony would whip Frederick's aunt. <clears throat> he says... I've often been awakened at the dawn of day by the most heart-rending shrieks of an own aunt of mine, whom he used to tie up to a joist and whip upon her naked back till she was literally covered with blood. No words, no tears, no prayers from his gory victim seemed to move his iron heart from its bloody purpose. The louder she screamed, the harder he whipped. And where the blood, and where the blood ran fastest, there he whipped longest. And I'm, I really want to zero in on this next passage because it contains several literary elements. Again, it may seem odd to, how, you know, gosh, how are you talking about literary elements when the scene here is so horrific and sad? Uh, but, but I'm going to tie those two together here. He says, he would whip her to make her scream and whip her to make her hush. Now, notice the rhythm of that. He would whip her to make her scream and whip her to make her hush. Notice how the rhythm there actually mirrors the action he's describing. That's a higher level of writing. That's what we call using the form of, of your sentence structure to, to mirror, to enact 
the very thing you're describing, the very action you're describing. That, that doesn't happen by accident. That's a, a skilled writer. And, and a lot of this may be intuitive. It's not that when you write, you say, let's see, how can I, you know, put these syllables together to, sometimes it is that, but, but, uh, but otherwise it's just, wow, this, you do it intuitively. Um, and not until overcome by fatigue would he cease to swing the blood clotted cow skin, cease to swing, da -dump, da -dump. that's iambic pentameter, or not pentameter, iambic rhythm that, that's nice and flowing and unencumbered, just like, you know, the, the he's this cruel um, Captain Anthony is, is whipping a Frederick's aunt without remorse, and there's a, a ironically an easy rhythm to it. It's such a harsh, uh, pitiless action, but he's like doing it as if he's, uh, you know, swinging a golf club or something. Um, but then notice, cease to swing the blood clotted cow skin. So we go from an iambic rhythm to um, spondaic rhythm where this is several stressed syllables in a row, blood clotted cow skin. And, and again, that enacts the, what, what, the, the very thing he's describing here. The whip is swinging freely, and then when it, you know, the, her blood starts to clot, in other words, the, the free-flowing blood starts to coagulate and clot, the, the rhythm of the sentence does the same. It, it, it moves from being the rhythm being free to, to kind of a log jam, if you will. It's brilliant, um, brilliant writing style here. Blood clotted cow skin. And again, the, the fact that he's a synecdoche again, blood clotted cow skin is so much more vivid than if he just said a whip, right? The balanced clauses, um, you know, he would whip her to make her scream and whip her to make her hush, how those are perfectly balanced on both sides of the, uh, the comma. And uh, again, one, one reason, um, oh, one other thing that he says, it was the bloodstained gate, the entrance to the hell of slavery through which I was about to pass. Now, obviously he's, he's using a metaphor here. He doesn't necessarily, he's not necessarily describing a literal gate with blood on it, but he's using that metaphorically. So. The fact that this former slave who was not educated, it was illegal to educate uh, slaves. The fact that he can not only learn to read and write, but do it at this high of a level is a testament to, well, you could say it's a testament to the human spirit, to Douglas himself, just as a, uh, a talented individual with a strong will. Um, you could say it's, well, what, what Douglas says about it, not just about this, but kind of his whole life, it's interesting, rather than him becoming bitter, I mean, if anyone had an excuse to, to not succeed in life and to just become bitter and, and blame the world for, for everything, it would be him. Um, but instead, Instead, notice what he, thought I had this marked, let me see. Yeah, given all that he went through, he, he you know, experienced um, just such, you know, horrific uh, circumstances and, and injustices, and yet he's able to say, I have ever regarded it as the first plain manifestation of that kind providence which has ever since attended me and marked my life with so many favors. Marked my life with so many favors. Imagine, you've been through what he's been through. Instead of becoming bitter, you actually maintain a spirit of gratitude. Uh, you, you believe God has granted you favors. That, again, to me, that's incredible. Uh, an amazing uh, testament. <clears throat> Okay, not only was Douglas a skilled 
you know, writer, like, like a skilled tactician uh, and rhetorician, but, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, a, a really deep, profound, astute thinker uh, as well. So for instance, let me give you just one example. He says, uh, he's talking here about the distinction between slaves, like the house slaves and the field slaves, and how there was this hierarchy that the, the house slaves were higher on the, the hierarchy. And he says, he was called the smartest and most trusty fellow who had this honor conferred upon him the most frequently. This honor being, uh, you know, the, the master's taking you out of the field and making you like a, a kind of a, an overseer, make, giving you as a slave some power over other slaves. He says the competitors for this office sought as diligently to please their overseers as the office seekers in the political parties seek to please and deceive the people. The same traits of character might be seen in Colonel Lloyd's slaves as are seen in the slaves of the political parties. I think that's such an astute insight that even, again, you would think, okay, you're, you're a slave and, and your fellow slaves, you would think you would have solidarity. And I'm sure, you know, they did in, in many ways, but, but, uh, Douglas is, is parsing that more finely and showing how, yeah, there was unity, but there was also, you know, division. I mean, he, he's, he's noticing interesting aspects of human nature that even in a situation like that, where you, you would think you would all be, um, you know, at least misery loves company, right? You're all uh, fellow victims. So you would, you would not turn on each other, but human nature is such that no, you do in that situation he's observing that some of these slaves are compete against each other willingly to um to gain the upper hand maybe part of it's just survival instinct but but the fact that that douglas compares this compares slaves to those who have who you would think would be opposite they have political power people in congress representatives of the political parties he's saying really they're not so different in, in, in many ways, there's still a lot of deception and backbiting. And anyway, I, I just think that's a good example of what a perceptive observer uh, Douglas is, observer of, of society and of, of human nature. Another insight Douglas gives us is, you know, a lot has been written about how slaves would sing in the field uh, as they work. And some people would use that as a to try to argue that, well, see, the slaves were content. They're they're perfectly happy, so slavery is not such a bad thing. Um, you know, they're being taken care of. Of course, that that's very you know condescending. The the subtext was that they're they were not smart enough to take care of themselves, and so they needed um, you know masters to uh, to take care of them. Now we have that today, not. In, in these terms, but it, some would argue that this is the same kind of paternalistic mentality that those who believe in really strong, ever-growing government have. They, they view the, the you know, average you know, people of all races as being too uh, dumb you know, to take care of themselves. And so therefore we need the, the elite intellectuals to tell us how to live, to take care of us. So this and again, that that is has transcended you know racial categories, um, and I believe that Douglas would would perceive that today and speak out against that as well. At any rate, why did the the slaves sing? Was it really that they were that was proof of their contentment? Not at all. Here's what Douglas says: I have often been utterly astonished since I came to the North to find persons who could speak of the singing among slaves as evidence of their contentment and happiness, it is impossible to conceive of a greater mistake. Slaves sing most, sorry, slaves sing most when they are most unhappy. The songs of the slave represented the sorrows of his heart, and he is relieved by them only as an aching heart is relieved by its tears. So the slave, he's saying the slaves sang 
most often when they were they were most unhappy. So it wasn't a sign of contentment. It was a a, a protest and a way of it was almost like crying, you know, a, a form of catharsis. <clears throat> Two other things. On the, the next page, this is in chapter three, like the second page of chapter three and the narrative. <clears throat> so he, he's pointing out another um, more kind of complex point. So he, he talks about this, the situation where a, a colonel, it's almost like a sinister version of, I can't remember the name of that TV show, where the, the CEO of the company goes on the front lines and, and, you know, is talking to just average employees and, and they don't, he's kind of incognito. They don't know who he is and he's, because he's trying to get a real feel for, you know, what do they really think about the company and the boss and so forth? Well, this slave owner does that. He goes out in the field and he asks one of the slaves, you know, what do you think about your, your master? And, and the guy's honest. He says, does the colonel treat you well? And the slave says, no, sir, was the ready reply. And then he goes on, he says, what does he give? Uh, what, does he work you too hard? Yes, sir. Well, don't he give you enough to eat? Yes, sir. He gives me enough such as it is. Well, it turns out that that was the colonel asking him this. And for his honesty, the slave was punished by being sold off to another, it says, to a, um, to a Georgia trader, forever sundered from his family and friends. And so Douglas says this about that situation. He says, it is partly in consequence of such facts that slaves, when inquired of as to their condition and the character of their masters, almost universally say they are contented and that their masters are kind. Right? So what... Again, he's explaining why, how is it that people get this, develop this view that, oh, the slaves are perfectly happy. It's not a bad institution. They even say it. Well, yeah, they, they say it, but, but Douglas explains why. They, they're, they're lying for, for survival. Um, they, they learn the hard way that if they don't lie, if they say, oh, yeah, my master's cruel, that they'll be treated even worse, sold off to you know, someone else. And, you know, all kind of uh, bad things can happen to them if, if they're, they're honest. And so another, it's a double-edged sword because also that's part of how the stereotype developed of, oh, well, you can't trust the slaves. You know, they're, they're, they're not honest. Well, it's not because they're inherently any less honest than, than anyone else of any other race. It's they, they learned they had to to be less than honest for the, the sake of survival. Um, one other uh, point, um, again, you, you would think, you know, today we have uh, a lot of times what, what some will call competing for victimhood. People try to say, well, who is the, the biggest victim? Um, who deserves the most pity? And part of that's human nature, I think, you know, Someone shows you a, an old injury. Man, yeah, well, I broke my my leg when I was playing football in high school. And then it's just human nature. Oh, well, that's nothing. I broke both of my legs. Yeah, there, so there's that thing. But, you know, when you, you get into identity politics and, and the valorization of victimhood uh, that goes along with identity politics, that whoever can claim to be, to have the, the, the most victimhood status is kind of the favor, you know, favored victimhood status. It's a, a really pernicious um, psychological roadblock that, again, is perpetuated by by many of the elites who claim to be, um, you know, claim to be champions of the, um, you know, the uh, of victims of minorities and and so on, but they're they're actually keeping them down. Um, and what, what some have called the, the soft bigotry of low expectations. And so check out this example. Douglas is very interesting, I think. 
Uh, he says, when Colonel Lloyd slaves met the slaves of Jacob Jepson, so slaves from two different masters that they, they come in contact with each other, they seldom parted without a quarrel about their masters. Again, you would think, wow, they, they would find solidarity. But Colonel Lloyd slaves contending that he was the richest and Mr. Jepson slaves that he was the smartest and most of a man. Colonel Lloyd slaves would boast his ability to buy and sell Jacob Jepson. Mr. Jepson slaves would boast his ability to whip Colonel Lloyd. These quarrels would almost always end in a fight between the parties. And those that whipped were supposed to have gained the point at issue. They seemed to think that the greatness of their masters was transferable to themselves. It was considered as being bad enough to be a slave, but to be a poor man's slave was deemed a disgrace indeed. I thought that was so interesting because, again, it's the opposite of competing victimhoods. Here you have these people who truly are victims. They're, they're slaves. And yet, rather than kind of wallowing in that, they, they are competing against each other, saying, you know, my master is better than your master. I mean, part of it, again, is it reminds me a little bit of how children are, you know, well, my dad can beat up your dad, you know, that, that kind of thing. But again, I think it's just an interesting insight in, into how peculiar the human mind is and how, how peculiarly the human mind works um, in general and, and also in, in a state of crisis in, in, in this case, um, in the throes of slavery. So that's Frederick Douglass, and I hope those insights helped you.